Hello, everybody. We are so excited to have you here tonight. Uh, Pacific College is happy to have this webinar about traditional Mesoamerican medicine for healing trauma. This is going to be quite a treat. I know that, uh, unfortunately, there's probably been a lot of trauma out there in the world in the last few months, and we need to use all the tools that we have available to us. So my name is Dr. Carrie Clark. I am the Director of Nursing at Pacific College of Health and Science, and I'm excited to be your moderator tonight. With us, we have Caroline Ortiz. She's an Associate Professor of Holistic Nursing and an Integrative Nurse Coach. Uh, so she's my colleague here at Pacific College. Her research focuses on cuanderism and traditional healing practices from Mex Mexico. And her co-presenter is Robert Vetter, also goes by Bob Vetter. He is a curandero, and he's an anthropologist and healer in the Mexican Mesoamerican tradition. He has a podcast on healing and spirituality in world cultures with Robert Vetter. He also has a healing practice right in New York City, and he also has a something called the, I'm going to try and say this, Temescal Mesoamerican Sweat Lodge. So we're super excited to have you, and it looks like your slides are up, so I'm going to pass it on over to you, Caroline and Bob. Thanks so much, Carrie, and hello to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Caroline Ortiz. Um, a special thank you and gratitude to Natalie and Miles, the behind the scenes wizards that make all of this happen and uh, make it happen smoothly for us. And um, hi to everyone that's joining us. I hope that uh, the next hour or so that you spend with us is not just interesting, but um, kind of inspires your curiosity to learn more about curanderismo, um, which is also known as traditional Mesoamerican medicine. So I'll open it up by giving a very quick overview and also very generalized overview of what is curanderismo. Curanderismo comes uh, would help if I advance the slide. All righty. Curanderismo comes from the uh, stem word uh, cura, which means heal in Spanish. Curanderismo is the traditional, is a traditional healing system from Mesoamerica, but curanderismo is also referring to the traditional systems of the Andean people and uh, of the Amazon. In this presentation, uh, we focus on curanderismo as it comes to us from the Mesoamerican civilizations and traditions through Mexico. There are two theories about where uh, curanderismo started, and they have to do with uh, the point of uh, colonization of Mesoamerica in the mid-16th century. So uh, one group um, of researchers and, and social scientists say that curanderismo was an already existing healing system that was native to the indigenous civilizations um, in that Mesoamerican area. Uh, there is also another theory that says curanderismo was born at the time of uh, contact or colonization by uh, Western um, conquerors, uh, re the religious merchants, and also slaves that came to, uh, came to the Americas from the West. And that curanderismo is actually an amalgamation of what is the indigenous system together with Western systems uh, and African systems, among others. The cosmology of curanderismo looks at uh, or incorporates the four cardinal directions, north, south, east, and west, as well as their energetic essences. So each of those directions has an energy or an, an essence, uh, a power, if you will. So in addition to the four cardinal directions, it also brings in the heavens, known as Father Sky, and the earth, known as uh, Mother Earth, and one's heart or the self. Um, 
the overall, uh, I, I don't say idea, but the, the goal, if you will, of curanderismo is to achieve harmony and balance. Um, and that is not just harmony and balance within the person in their, uh, in their healing or in their health or well-being, but there's also this cosmic balance that everything is uh, looking to be in harmony or looking to balance between the two extremes. So this may be male and female, hot and cold, wet and dry, up and down. Um, it also seeks to harmonize the self and that's the capital S self with other, other people um, other elements of the natural world, the universe, but also the multidimensionality of existence. Within a person, curanderismo sinks harmony and balance between the mind, the body, the spirit, and the emotions. And it sees each of these things, both internal and external to the human being, as completely inseparable. So that which is done to the, let's say the natural world, affects the universe, affects your inner spirit, affects your body, affects your neighbor. Um, so there really is a huge uh, emphasis placed on the community and the effects on the whole group, as opposed to valuing simply the individual first and foremost. Another element to curanderismo is that in curanderismo and in the journey of healing, that implies an active role and a responsibility, both on the uh, person searching for healing, on the elements that it uses as part of that healing journey, the people that are invited to partake in or help someone toward this healing journey, um, everyone should be an active participant, but also responsible for themselves and for the community. So it very much is a communal activity. In curanderismo, there is no governing body. There is no, um, say, board that, uh, that looks for uh, practice standards or looks after uh, uh, practitioners and making sure they have all of their credentials set and submitted. Um, they, it, it doesn't work that way. It hasn't been formed that way. It really came about as an oral, uh, an oral learning under, um, through apprenticeships, through um, just lifelong learning and teaching. Now, though, nowadays, you can actually uh, go to formal schools, although there are still uh, teachers that will take on apprentices, but you can also go and take classes and, and go to schools that um, that will teach you some of these elements of curanderismo. The other thing that I want to be sure to mention is that, especially where I grew up uh, in South Texas, in the Rio Grande Valley on the border with Mexico and on the coast of the Gulf of Mexico, the word itself, curanderismo, often is associated with things like black magic, uh, witchcraft, evil doing, um, fortune telling, or things like that, uh, casting spells and hexes. Um, and I too, sort of under growing up in, in that community, understood that that's what that was. Um, many years later, and after being exposed to so much more and reading so much more beyond, um, coming to find out that it truly, is, the word curanderismo truly says what it is. It is a system for healing. I have come to find it to be such a sophisticated and complex system that is uh, promoting healing, maintaining health, and uh, restoration of well-being for not just a person or for people, but really for the entire planet and beyond. And so when we refer to the practices of curanderismo, 
What I'm referring to are the many home remedies that fall under the purview of curanderismo, such as herbs, um, also rituals and ceremony, um, and also consulting of a healer. And so in curanderismo, the healers, the traditional healers are known as curanderos or curanderas. So that's what I'm referring to uh, when we talk about curanderismo as a, as a healing system. One of the most basic and um, for, many, uh, for many healers and for many uh, patients that seek curanderismo for healing, um, see the plática as critical, crucial, fundamental to healing and well-being. The plática is a heart-to-heart -heart talk. It is very intimate. Um, it is usually a one-on-one -on -one, uh, connection between the healer, be it a curandero, a curandera, and the patient. Um, in that, the healer works very purposefully, consciously, and also energetically to bring out in the patient their problems, their worries, their concerns, their feelings. And very often where the platica leads um, is well beyond and much deeper than that which the person kind of thought that they came in to, to try to solve or to try to remedy. Um, it might be, if we use sort of common terms in, in our world, you might say it's sort of a version of talk therapy, but it is very deep. Um, it is very energetically connected, and there is a mutual commitment to that healing journey between the, uh, the healer and the patient. So now I will introduce my, uh, my partner and friend and uh, uh, teacher, Mr. Bob Vetter. Thanks, Caroline. So I'm going to pick up from uh, where Caroline left off and talk a little bit about a condition called susto. And it's sometimes described as trauma, although I wouldn't say it's identical with it, that they're, they kind of overlap one another. Susto in the, the medical anthropology literature is sometimes translated the word as magical fright. And it's interesting because we find this concept all over Latin America, not just Mexico, but throughout Latin America, there is this concept of susto, that certain events in our life uh, occur that cause us to have a condition that we call susto. And it, it actually doesn't exist in the Western world, in the Western medical uh, community. There isn't an equivalent term. Uh, the closest thing we can come to it is trauma, although as I said, there is similarity, but they're not identical terms. So what is susto? Susto is a condition where a part of you, and I'm gonna go into the, the belief system that underlies this, um, is that we, we have a soul and we don't lose the soul. If you've heard the term soul loss, it's similar to that. Not that the soul is lost, but what happens during certain events in our lives when we are shocked. Um, the, one way to look at it is something, an event that happens that causes you to go oh, like that, to catch your breath like that, that is a susto. And what happens every time that occurs is that some splinter or some fragment of the soul separates. And if we look at it, in terms of the, the modern medical way of looking at trauma, the way we would describe it is as a dissociation that occurs because something overwhelming has happened in that person's life. So in the, the cosmic realm, we, we would say that a splinter of the soul is left at that place. So let's say, for example, that I'm driving on the highway and I get in a car accident. 
Well, that moment of unexpected impact is going to cause me a susto. So theoretically, what I should do, according to this way of looking at it, is I should get something from the place where the accident took place. And I should bring that with me to a curandero or a curandera to perform a ceremony to coax this part of the soul back in. And there are a variety of different ways of doing this. Sometimes we use the person's name and in fact, all of the nicknames that that person has ever been known as. And one person or several people will call that part of the soul back in. We also do something where we blow the soul back in and we use, um, we use alcohol or some sort of a, a solution in the mouth that you blow directly onto the person. And what you do is you're actually trying to, to surprise and shock the person again. So when they got the susto, they went like this, <gasps> like that. And when we want to cure susto, we do the same. Same thing, we shock the person, we surprise the person. And then there are much more complex ceremonies as well. But what we're doing is we are coaxing back that part that left. And the, the, another way to look at it is that when something overwhelming happens, that part of the self that splinters off is doing that in order to protect the person. So this dissociation that occurs at, at the moment of the shock and surprise is in order to preserve something, in order to save that part from being harmed. So what starts as, out as a, a short-term solution to a problem actually leads to further problems down the road. Because if you have susto that is completely um, untreated, it can lead to much worse things in the long run. So susto can directly lead to things like uh, alcoholism, drug abuse, um, a complete uh, disconnection from reality. People lose their appetite. They lose their desire to live. So there are all of these things that are connected with it in the, um, in the Latin American world that we might not necessarily uh, consider a part of that experience. Um, in a couple of moments, you're going to be seeing a clip with uh, one of my teachers and my dear friend, Laurencio Lopez Nunez. And, you know, he's been coming over uh, from Oaxaca, Mexico, to stay at my home for, I don't know, the last seven or eight years or something like that. And Every time he goes into New York City with me, what he says when he looks around at the people on the street is he says, every single person on the street in New York City has susto. I would argue that right now in this, this post-COVID world that we're living in, that everybody has susto as a result of the fright that we have in confronting the news, in confronting uh, all of our social relations with everyone around us. And one of the things that we look at in curanderismo is that our health is not only determined by our mind, body, spirit, and emotions, but by the, the network of relations that we have in our family and in our community. And the time that we are living in right now, I would argue, is really a time of susto, where per, just about everybody could use some treatment for susto. So with that, Caroline, I'm going to turn it over to you to, to uh, show the next, oh, maybe I should introduce it real quick before we, we begin that. So what you're going to see in a moment is um, a video clip of Laurencio Lopez Nunez on the left and our, our dear friend uh, on the right, um, who came down with me to Oaxaca. And this was, Laurencio is going to be doing a limpia and a soul retrieval on Gabriel. So limpia means a, a spiritual cleansing. So limpiar is to clean and we cleanse the soul in the ceremony. In most cases, 
the limpia and the soul retrieval are two separate ceremonies, but Laurencio kind of combines the two and he, there are gonna be elements of both of those things happening in what he is doing with Gabriel. Now, when, when we went down to Oaxaca, uh, Gabrielle had a cameraman with her, and that's how we ended up with this footage. They did some professional shooting and professional editing of this, and I think it does a really good job of giving you a, a, a sense of the experience of what takes place during Olympia and a soul retrieval. So after we watch this, I'll try to kind of deconstruct for you what you've seen. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Caroline, to run this. Dolor, pain, llanto, uh, 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 tears, uh, sadness. Y que no puedes cómo controlarlo. And you don't know how to control it. I can't no, control it. Eso no es. 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 Eso no Ven, ven, Gabriel, ven, ven, estés donde estés, regresa, aquí está tu cuerpo, aquí está tu ser, en este corazón de tu hija Gabriel, ven Espíritu, ven, Gabriel, ven, ven, aquí, con el Espíritu, hasta tu gran Padre del Cielo, limpela de todas las malas energías, de todas las malas vibraciones, de tu no se va a ver su ser y en su corazón. Saca el gran padre de a lo que está enferrado en su ser y en su corazón. Ayúdanos a sacar su espíritu y a su corazón. Yo te lo pido, gran padre de cielo. Ayuda en este camino de la tierra, en este camino de la vida. Yo te lo pido, gran padre de cielo. Nunca en tu cuerpo. Nunca en este cuerpo de tu hijo. Ayuda a la gran padre de cielo. Gracias, gran padre de cielo. Por ayudarnos. Ayúdala en su camino, que así sea gran Padre del Cielo, que así sea gran Señor del Universo. Gracias te damos, gracias gran Madre Tierra, gracias gran Padre Viento. Tristezas, tus depresiones, tómete. May the great universe take care for you and protect you.
So I hope you all enjoyed uh, seeing that. I wanted to just kind of go through some of the things that you saw during that to help make a little more sense. So the it opens with um, with him building a fire and uh, taking the coals from it and putting the coals in something called a popush comit. Uh, in Spanish, it's known as a salmerio. And you see it in the slide that's up right now. The woman is holding up this uh, vessel. It's a sacred incense burner that has been um, consecrated and connected to a lineage of teachers and practitioners. So I inherit, for example, this, this energetic connection to the generations before. So you saw him putting the, the coals in and then copal is the name of a tree in Mexico that they cut slits in so that the, the, the sap of it runs out and then crystallizes and we use that resin on the coals in order to create the smoke that you see here. You also saw Laurencio uh, have an altar on the ground. And on that altar, you saw a black disc, which is an obsidian mirror. And in this way of looking at the world and looking at ourselves, we, we have a dark side to us as well as the light side. And the, the obsidian mirror is a way of gaining insight into ourselves from looking at that obscured, um, that normally obscured aspect of self. There were also beams on it that represent um, our connection with Mother Earth. Uh, you also saw mezcal, which is a, a form of alcohol. And we use mezcal a lot during ceremonies. Uh, and then you, the next thing that you saw was him performing something called a barrida which is using the herbs or plants to sweep away negative energy that may have accumulated. And one way to look at this, I'll, I'll demonstrate this in a few minutes, how I can do this on myself. But the whole idea is that when, in our experiences every day, we have positive and we have negative emotional experiences. And the negative emotions have a way of piling up, kind of like a layer of dust that lands on you and then another layer on top of that and another layer on top of that. And what we do in limpia and in barida is to remove those layers of dust to give us a fresh start. So he was praying for Gabriel while he was sweeping her um, with those herbs. You also heard him call back her spirit. He told her to come back to invite the parts of her that might have left at some point during Susto to come back that we've prepared a, a safe place for these, these parts to return to. You also saw him using an egg in the limpia. That's the, often the, the main part of the ceremony. And we have a belief that the egg itself is a perfect cell and that it has the ability to draw in to absorb negative energy. So in the barida, we're sweeping away the kind of the, the surface of it, but in the egg cleansing, we're going much deeper and we're using that egg to absorb all of that negative energy that we wanna get rid of. Now, in some cases in the limpia, we will use the egg, we'll drop the, we'll open the egg and drop it into a glass of water. And in that case, we use, uh, we wait about five or 10 minutes and look at the egg white and the egg yolk and use it as a way of diagnosing what the nature of the problem is. Um, and different, different curanderos and different traditions have different ways of doing it. So for example, um, I had a Olympia myself with a man uh, in central Mexico who did a way that I've never seen done before, but he was able to actually look at the egg in the water to diagnose the functioning of the specific organs in my body. Uh, so the egg is very important. And in this case, um, Laurencio didn't open the egg, but there's, an, um, there's a way of disposing of that egg as well to make sure that the negative energy that was absorbed into it 
uh, is completely released into the ground. You also saw him blowing the mezcal onto uh, Gabriel, and that's to give the body that shock that I mentioned earlier. It's blown particularly onto what are called the articulations of the body, because these are the places of greatest vulner energetic vulnerability. Uh, then you saw him smudging her using the smoke, blowing the smoke directly onto her to almost end the ceremony. And then there was a prayer uh, that was partially translated. You, you uh, saw and heard him talking about what he wanted for her, for her protection, for these elements of the universe to help her in her life. And then he ended with the word omen which I'd like to explain. And it's a word from the Nahuatl language. That's the, the group from central Mexico, the Mexica, also known as the Aztec people. And in their language, this word ometeo means literally two energies. And Caroline did a nice job of explaining the Mesoamerican ancient cosmology. Um, in that cosmology, there is the belief that originally there was just an undifferentiated oneness that made up all of the universe. And that oneness gave way to the two, the sacred duality, Ometekutli and Omesiwat. So there was this divine couple that represented these, these uh, two energies of male and female and light and dark and hot and cold and all of the all of the things that define the material world that we live in, we experience all our world through this duality. That couple then gave birth to four sons who became the guardians of the four directions. And the four directions are extremely important in all of the work that we do, because we believe that these four directions also have energies and a spirit that we can call upon to help us in the work that we do. So you've probably noticed that curanderismo has a very solid core of spirituality and that we use prayer as a way of connecting us with energies that are more powerful than we are that we incorporate into the work that we do. So Carolyn, should I go directly on to demonstrate? You want me to do that? Sure. Okay. All right. So what I have set up behind me, you're not going to be able to see it perfectly, but behind me, I have an altar. And this altar is, it has the, the sacred elements that we're going to be using here today. This is the poposhkomi, and there are a number of different styles, but this is the sacred incense burner that you heard us talk about. And that is at the center of my altar, which is on a red paliacate or bandana. On the east side, I have a container of water with obsidian in it, a piece of obsidian that absorbs any negative energies. To the west, I have a candle, and this one in particular has the Virgin of Guadalupe, who to the Mexican people in general and to us within curanderismo, has tremendous significance. And she's sometimes identified with Tonantzin, which is Mother Earth. And that's the term, uh, the pre-Hispanic, pre pre-Catholic term for that spirit, that energy. To the south, I have a stone. And to the north, I have my feathers. So these are the, these represent the four sacred elements, water, fire, air, and earth. Now I'm going to be demonstrating, uh, I'm putting on this bandana that's red, and you'll notice that I'm wearing red and I'm wearing white. So the white represents purification, and the red represents life, the life force. It, uh, it also offers protection to the person who's wearing it. Now I'm going to be lighting my poposhkomi using a charcoal tablet. This is kind of the, the faster indoor way to do it. 
but I'm going to light my charcoal and then get my popoche cone meat burning. And I'm using a lighter. Not everybody likes the use of lighters. But I could use matches. I could use a, a fire drill. So I'm going to put this in my salmerio or my popoche cone meat. In just a moment, that'll be hot enough to put the smoke on it. I also grabbed some plants from my garden. So I have some fresh basil and I have some rosemary that I'm going to be using. And the plants are really important because the plants not only contain essential oils and uh, things in them, constituent elements of them that are healing, but we also have the belief that the plants have a spirit that we can call upon to help us as well. I have that, and I also have a, a chili that I'm going to be using in this uh, barrida, the, this part of the, the self Olympia that I'm going to do. And I have water. So my copal, my, uh, my charcoal is hot by now. So I'm going to take a piece of copal and I'll ceremonially place it in my po poposhko meat. And I should say that the poposhko meat is really maybe the most important basic element in a person who is going down this path of curanderismo because we use this in all of the ceremonies and all of the healing activities that we do. And people have one for their home. That's one type of poposhko meat. The second type is the kind that will be used in working with a patient or a client. And that's the, the kind that I have here. Now, normally, if I had a person with me, I would do this, uh, I would smudge the person with this smoke. But now during COVID, I'm doing most of my work via Zoom. Uh, and I'll, I, what I do is demonstrate how to do this step myself and then have the client or the patient do it for him or herself. So I'm going to address the four directions in my movements facing ahead of me and facing behind me four times. Now I'm going to repeat these movements at the height of my lower back. And now if I want, I can kind of circle around myself. I can also purify my space, open up sacred space in the room by doing counterclockwise circles around the room. And in that way, I've purified not only myself, but the space that I'm in. Now I'll take, this is the part that is the barrida. Now, in the version of it that you saw Laurencio do, you really didn't get to see the platica, but we begin, before we actually get to this step, we begin with the platica, where we identify the specific root causes of the problem. And once we've done that, we can use the barrida and the limpia to remove the negative emotional energies. So you can either do this as a general thing where you're just getting rid of, you're just sweeping away anything that might have piled up or a deeper way to do the work is to identify the specific emotions that you want to shift. So if that were the case, let's say that I was driving around in traffic and I came back and I'm really, really angry and I have this, this, this rage, this anger inside of me. Well, I might go to my altar and I might express specifically that I want to remove this anger. Now, I don't want to, it's not that I'm fighting against it. What I'm doing is through ceremony, I'm giving a way to allow those emotions to pass through me. And theoretically, I mean, really no, no emotion is by itself negative, 
all of our emotions have a purpose. But in curanderismo, we say that most illness, most things that we would consider a disease or an illness, most of those things come from emotions that have been blocked. And what we say is that what flows is healthy and what blocks, what is blocked is unhealthy. So we use these ceremonies to move those emotions. So if I wanna do the barida part of it, I'm gonna dip these plants in the water and I'm gonna ask the spirit of the water and this plant and the four directions and the sky above, the earth below, my own heart, all of these elements, these energies, I'm gonna ask them to be with me and I'm gonna ask them to transmute any negative energy that I might have, any negative emotions that are causing me problems. Ask that with this motion that I sweep that away to give myself a new start. And I'm gonna use similar, a similar set of motions with the chili pepper. And the chili pepper is really something that we, we go to when we have something really kind of, kind of bad stuck in us. We can use it in this way. We could also burn it with copal if we have what we consider to be particularly dark energy. But I'll do this, I'll use the same motion that I did before, starting at the head and making my way down. And the more I give voice to the things that I want in this, the better. Because by giving voice to my intentions, voice to the things that I want to get rid of, the more I do that, the better. So I'm going to ask that any negative emotions that might have stacked up for me, that they be removed through this chili pepper. Any fear, any anger, disappointment, jealousy, rage, self-loathing, confusion, embarrassment. I ask that all of these emotions be absorbed in this chili that I'm going to get rid of later. Allow me to have unrestricted flow of happiness, compassion, kindness, confidence, all of the things that allow me to be a better person in this world and be more available to the people around me and to make a difference. O Meteo. Okay, so I don't know about you guys, but I feel a little lighter. Anyway, Caroline, that's going to bring me to the end of the demo, so I'll turn it back over to you at this time. Thank you so much for that, Bob. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm watching, I'm just sort of mesmerized by the, um, by all that goes into what this healing system has to offer. Um, all the different elements that we can use, all the different um, levels that it works on or that it, it seeks to shift, but yet within this idea of oneness and integrality and um, balance and harmony. Um, and I loved what you said about uh, none of these emotions are bad in and of themselves. They're all sort of the, the opposite end of, of a cosmic duality, if you will, um, but that they can be shifted and, and reharmonized. So I did want to, to just share with everyone that's um, that's here with us now that um, I came to the curanderismo. I won't give you my whole story, but shout out to Los Fresnos and shout out to the Rio Grande Valley um, because I, my mom was a nurse. When I would get sick, she would take me to the pediatrician. If she was working, which was most of the time, and I was with my grandmother, 
she would take me to the local curandera, Doña Panchita. And while and I was a kid, I didn't quite understand it. Um, I thought it was kind of, it was different. It was cool. And anyone that kind of grew up with this knows about, oh, the egg. Oh yeah, she did the egg. Oh, okay. Everybody sort of has this understanding about what happens with your grandma and the egg. But I really left this world to, to my grandmother. That was my grandmother's purview and, and her community and her friends and her generation wrapped up in well, some superstitious kind of nonsense. Um, but I am so grateful to, um, to my grandmother, to Doña Panchita, to my family and, and all of my teachers along the way so that um, I can come back to look at this uh, curanderismo, this system, these gifts that have been uh, kept alive over centuries and that continue to live on by people also like you, Bob, that, um, that use it respectfully, lovingly, and for kind of the good of all of us and of all of us. So thank you thank so you. much for that. My pleasure. So I know it's strange, a, a gringo doing curanderismo. <laughs> Well, we come in all shades, let's say. <laughs> <laughs> so if there's any questions, um, Carrie? Yes, you do have some good questions coming in and lots of great comments and lots of uh, great to see so many people here and just amazing. So um, I'm gonna try and start at the top so we'll kind of work our way back down to getting through to the ritual part. Um, but a lot of people are interested in sort of how this relates to Chinese medicine and acupressure points. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. And then I also mentioned psychoneuroimmunology. So um, I don't know if you have any thoughts around those kind of topics. Sure. Uh, Caroline, do you mind if I take that one or I'll start? So <laughs> there's, there's a great deal of commonality between traditional Chinese medicine and curanderismo. And, you know, there, there are theoretical, you know, we could look theoretically at possibly that there was a, that they have a, a, a similar origin. If you buy into the theory of the Bering Land Strait and that, uh, that people came over from Asia into the Americas, maybe that's an explanation. Maybe it's independent origin, whatever it is. Um, there are remarkable similarities, even in acupuncture, believe it or not. And there are similar concepts of the movement of energy in the body and the, the polarity of yin and yang, or in this case, um, these male and female energies. And they actually used cactus spines as acupuncture needles. Um, a book that I might recommend for those of you who are interested in the commonality between curanderismo and traditional Chinese medicine is a book called Wind in the Blood. Um, I don't have the author's name, but I'm sure it's easy enough to look it up, but it explores this, this commonality between the two. And there are lots and lots of parallels, both in theory and in techniques. Awesome. And some people, uh, one person also mentioned shadow work, which kind of makes sense with the bringing back in what has left. Um, one person asked if, is there a way to measure like how big or the grandiosity of the susto? <laughs> um, well, if you mean how big it is, like from the, the perspective of the curandero or curandera working with the person, um, the, I, I think what I got from what they were asking was like, how do you know how much of this person has left of their soul? Oh yeah. That's a good question. Back in. I think yeah. that was well, you, you know, there's one way of doing it, which, which is kind of what you saw Laurencio do, where he's just, he's simply calling back the parts that were lost. But in the more complex ceremonies, we do a life review. And we stop at the moments in time where these various sustos occurred. And sometimes, in my experience, the person who I'm guiding through this experience will hit a moment that didn't seem that significant to them at the time, but all of a sudden they realize through ceremony that this was a profound moment and that this was really where their, their, uh, the issues that came up later in life 
started around that one central experience that may not even have seemed to be that big of a deal at the time, but that get, gets linked. And what the first susto becomes like the weak link in the chain. So it tends to be connected to another one and another one and another one. And that's why we find these patterns in our lives because unless it's healed, it's something that, that tends to come up over and over again. So we have individual sustos that are going to be of varying levels of intensity. And then over the course of a lifetime, we have the, the, the fallout from all of those many sustos that were not resolved. I hope that, that answers that yeah, I question. Think, I think that does answer that. And that reminds me a little bit of like EMDR. I mean, you're even doing a bilateral uh, approach there. So very interesting. Yeah. Uh, someone asked why you move counterclockwise. Sure. So there are some things that we do that are clockwise and some things that we do that are counterclockwise. My understanding of it is that counterclockwise liberates energy. So when we want to get rid of something, we want, when we want to move something, we go counterclockwise. But when we want to seal in the work that we've done so that the work remains, we use a clockwise directionality and ceremony. Awesome. And what do you do with that chili pepper afterward? <laughs> That's a very good question. So all of the things that we use um, come from Mother Earth, from Tonantzin. And we want to return all of these things to the earth as well. So the way that I was taught is that I take these with me and I go out into nature. And I talk to Mother Earth, you know, I don't assume, I don't presume that I can do anything to this earth without permission. And I explain to Mother Earth that I'd like to open her up, that I'd like to um, dig a hole, which is going to be to pierce through her skin. And I'm going to ask her for permission first. And if she gives me permission, I'm going to dig a hole and I'm going to take a pinch of tobacco and use the tobacco to communicate with the creator up above Mother Earth below. And I'm going to ask specifically that the energy that is contained within that pepper, that it be absorbed into the earth. And I'm going to ask Mother Earth to take that pain and that suffering from me. And what starts out as a poison in my system actually is of benefit to the earth because Mother Earth has the ability to transmute that into nourishment as long as I do this in a respectful way. So the way that I get rid of that chili is extremely important, or I can throw it into a body of moving water uh, by throwing it over my shoulder facing away from it. Those are the two ways that we get rid of um, these things from nature that we use. Uh -huh. And with the the comment about everybody in New York having a uh, susto. Are there kuanderas or do you do this work as well where you work on sort of a grand scale, healing the earth, healing communities? Um, yeah, when we, when, we have, when we have a temascal, we have a huge group of people here. You know, sometimes we, my temascal holds about 30 people and sometimes we, I mean, not now during COVID, but in the past, we've had to do two in one day because we have so many people. And before we go in, we call in the directions and we're calling in the healing for the earth, for the people in that circle, for the families back home, for the wider community, and ultimately the healing of our entire planet and all of the people on it. So yeah, we, you know, we, we start local and then go from there. So a lot of the work in Curanderismo is one-on-one, -on -one, but we believe that we are connected to the people around us. So when we work on ourselves, we're improving the quality of the relations uh, for everybody in our family, in our community, and, and that's the way we, we start to change the world. Yeah, that, that sounds a little bit like a loving kindness practice from Buddhism as well, right? You start with yourself and then work your way out to the larger community, so. And that's, that's an important topic also in curanderismo. You know, I started my work with traditional North American Indian medicine, which kind of has a slightly different take on this. 
because in their systems of medicine, the way that I learned it, we, we start with our work with somebody else. We take our prayers and pray not for ourselves, but we pray for the people in our family, in our community. We pray for everybody else. And I pray for myself last. Whereas in curanderismo, I start with myself. And the analogy that is often given is it's like when you're on the airplane and they drop down the oxygen masks. And before I put oxygen on even my own child, I put it on myself. Because if, if I'm conscious and awake, I'm in a position to help somebody else. Right. Uh and I think we, we definitely as healers ourselves, I think almost everyone here that I'm seeing attending is, is a healer too. And that's a good lesson for all of us. Um, we have a person here who's interested in how does one learn the skills of kulandarism? Well, let's see. Traditionally, I keep answering questions. Caroline, would you like to answer that? <laughs> Doing quite well, Bob. No, I just, um, I just do want to share the resources um, which I can do right now as you're answering that great question. Okay. So how do you learn curanderismo? Um, traditionally, we say that, that there are people who are born with a don. And don is a gift that you are given at birth. Um, so there is a healing don that certain people have. They, they just come into this world in that way. There are people who learn... Uh, the specific healing practices in dreams and visions. And there are people who learn it from a family member. So often it's a, it, it tends to skip a generation. So you might've had a grandma or a grandpa who was a curandera or a curandero who teaches that next generation. And then you have people who choose to apprentice with somebody um, who knows curanderismo. So through this, apprenticeship you may learn as well. Awesome. And uh, we have a question. Can couples be healed in ceremony together? Yes and no. <laughs> um, and what I mean by yes and no is that if the, the nature of what they are being healed of has to do with them as a couple, then yes, it would be beneficial to have the two of them together. But if they're each dealing with individual issues that they've come to be healed, it's preferable that each one would have a separate session. Okay. And um, this question is for me. So how often do you go through the ritual? Like you said, you know, you get home and you're stressed out. And um, so how, is this a daily practice for you? No, I wouldn't say it's daily. Um, I do it when I, when I feel like I need it. You know, I'm, I try to be sensitive to my own energy, which, you know, and I, 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 I don't like to use the word energy too much because I don't mean all of this to sound really woo woo. It actually has a lot to do with common sense. So if you think of yourself as being this vessel and, you know, we have, we have heat underneath and, it builds the pressure. So each stressful experience that we have stacks up on top of the other one. Now at the top, you have this valve that kind of blows open. So what you don't want to do is wait until the pressure builds up so much that that valve is going to blow. So we as healers have the responsibility of our own self care to monitor our own emotional state, figure out where we are and what we need to do to maintain ourselves, again, to be the best that we possibly can in helping others. So I do it as, as necessary. And, you know, there are things that I'll do for myself. And then I'll go to a curandero or a curandera when I feel that I really need some work myself. Yeah, I think that reaching out to other healers is really important for our work as as healers. Um, 
you know, sometimes I think we, we think it's all about just self-care and we can take care of ourselves, but we really do need to be on that healing journey and to reach out and connect and be with others in our community and to keep learning too. I certainly learned a lot tonight. So, I And I think I- within curanderismo, we also have that, that wounded healer concept that I think probably most of the people watching right now are aware of that, that, you know, why do we go into a healing profession in the first place? Well, probably because something happened in my life. So whatever it was that caused me to need to be healed is kind of a clue about the way that I have a power or ability to work with somebody else. So I'm responsible not only for my initial healing, but I'm responsible for that entire path of continuously learning, growing, becoming more in order to be able to share more. That is, you know, right in line too with what we think about in holistic nursing as well. We even have a theory called nurses wounded healer. So um, it's great to see so many alignments. I think this has been an absolutely wonderful presentation. So engaging. You've got a lot of great comments here and this will be uh, it has been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel too. So thank you so much, Bob and Caroline. Uh, I think we learned a lot and I think we're looking forward to maybe having you back in the future and learning some more. So that would be great. Be happy to. Thanks thank so much. Thank you so much, Thanks, everybody. Karen. You're welcome. Thanks, Bob and Carrie. Thanks, Caroline. Have a good night. Bye-bye.